Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending where uh, where you're calling from. And uh, welcome to this week's edition of Unleashed. I'm your host, Jeff Tetz, the CEO of Results. Results is an organization that helps leaders and companies unleash their potential. And so in this whole nightmare that is COVID-19 and the crisis that ensues hit us, we thought what, uh, what better uh, way to extend the work that we're, uh, that we're accustomed to doing uh, but to launch a, uh, a weekly series that's all about unleashing your potential as a leader, as a person, and, and ultimately with your teams and inside of your businesses. I want to thank everyone that's joining us today, and we continue to grow the audience, we continue to grow the community. This weekly session is for you. Uh, so our hope is that when the show comes and goes, you've, you've picked up at least one or two things that you can start to apply into your life right away for the betterment of all of your relationships, for the betterment of your, of your organizations uh, and the groups that, that, you, uh, that you participate with. And we really appreciate the folks that are helping spread the message. So some of the people that are here today have sent it out to their executive teams and their managers across their organizations. We've even got some really large organizations like the Vancouver Regional Construction Association, the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, and all of Allison for Gail's academic colleagues are, uh, are joining us today as well. So welcome if you're first time and welcome back uh, if you've seen some of the other uh, the episodes. The way to navigate your experience here today to get the, uh, the most out of it is to ensure that you're interacting with attendees as you wish in the chat box. But if you want to get really personal with Allison on today's uh, session, please use the Q&A box. So you'll see there's two places that you can put comments. The questions go in the Q&A box at the bottom of your toolbar. Uh, so that's where we're going to start to answer questions throughout the hour. Now, if you have questions that you want to get to Allison and we don't have a chance to answer them today live, our show producer, Sean Fitzgerald, will be answering questions behind the scenes. And you can also uh, email any of your questions and comments to info at unleashresults.com. And that's anytime. So any questions that you have, we'll make sure that we answer those questions promptly and we'll get those questions to Allison uh, as well. Uh, so when the show is over, the other thing that we would really appreciate is your feedback. So we want to make sure that these are highly valuable for your time so that you come back and you tell everybody that you know. Uh, we also uh, want to make sure that we're curating content that's highly relevant and applicable for what you're currently experiencing. So rather than just uh, close your browser, when you, when you close out of the session, please click on a continue button. So there'll be a continue button at the bottom of your screen that will direct you to a feedback page. We even have some special offers there. So we wanna be along this journey with you to help you unleash your potential. So we actually have leadership workshops, complimentary sessions that we're running for you and your executive teams. If you wanna take some of the things that you learned today and put them into action into your own business. So now on with the show. Today we're discussing the science of negotiation. Uh, so uh, happy to have my co-host back for her second show today is my accomplished colleague, Barbara Reppert. Now, Barbara is a business execution specialist with our firm results, and she provides coaching, training, and advisory to senior leaders and their teams, uh, trying to help them build successful and sustainable businesses. Now, she's held several uh, senior executive roles uh, through her career, and most recently, she actually started her own company, Executive Impact Coaching. Really encourage you to check that out. Welcome, Barbara. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jeff. And I'm super excited to be back. So thanks for the opportunity, but super excited about the topic today. So anybody that knows me, they probably heard my famous quote, which is don't let others shoot on you. <laughs> and I don't want you to shoot on others. I do a lot of coaching around. So Allison, I am so excited that you're here talking about negotiation and relationships. It, anyways, it's just great to be back with you and welcome, welcome. Thanks so much, Barbara. And we are, uh, we're absolutely thrilled that, uh, that Allison for Gail is joining us from her home in Chicago today. So uh, Allison has got a very lengthy and accomplished uh, bio. She's a research psychologist and award-winning professor at the University of North Carolina's world-renowned business school. And she's really on a mission to help others achieve career success and live happier by understanding and applying the science of people and how we behave. She's an international keynote speaker and a trainer on negotiation, power, and influence and she really brings her deep academic experience to leaders and organizations who are looking to enhance their well-being, efficiency, and effectiveness. She's passionate about sharing her knowledge of how humans think, feel, and act, and to really help professionals tackle their biggest challenges, uh, understanding and managing people around us. Isn't that the truth? 
So today, uh, we're going to be exploring the negoti negotiation, the science of relationship management. And uh, a little sort of tidbit for everybody, I s have seen Allison give uh, a talk on negotiation before, and this is about a year ago at our BEX summit. And a few months later in Vancouver in the summer, I used what I learned to negotiate myself a free gym membership. It's actually a testimonial on our website. So this stuff works. Uh, it really does work. Uh, so, uh, Allison, before we dive into the science of negotiation, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you decided to take your career down this path to begin with? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, I do remember, Jeff, when you emailed me, you told me I was changing the world one free gym pass at a time, which I, I'll take that. Um, so, yeah, I, it was not my childhood dream to become a professor, as I, as I tell uh, all my students. I actually um, was working as a management consultant for McKinsey & Company. And that's really what got me um, where I am today. Um, I, I kind of naively took that job thinking the hardest part of the job would be the strategic advising I was asked to do. And what I found very quickly was the hardest part of the job was the interpersonal piece. And that was for two reasons that I understand now that I didn't understand then. And one was when you work in consulting, no one reports to you, right? You serve your clients. And when you work in consulting, I also realized nobody likes you. Right? It's the saddest and loneliest job in the world for this very predictable reason, right? As soon as people hear the consultants are coming, what that signifies to people is it signifies change. And we know that change makes people anxious. And when people are anxious, it has to go somewhere. And where is it gonna go? It's gonna go back to the consultant, to the, to the newcomer, the outsider. So um, as I said, I thought the hardest part would be the job, but what I found was hard was all of the interpersonal strategizing I had to do when I was confronted with clients who didn't know me, didn't trust me, didn't want to work with me, and I couldn't even snap at them and say, you have to do this, it's your job. So what I found myself doing a lot during my time as a consultant was thinking about how do you negotiate with people? How do you influence people? How do you motivate people? All of the things that are part of uh, organizational psychology and human behavior, which is what I now do. And I realized that that was really what I wanted to understand. And that was the way um, that I wanted to um, contribute to what was going on in organizations. So that was my my turn. I went and got my PhD. I became a professor, and then I'm bringing all the science and the research that we do in academia also back to organizations to say, look, a lot of the stuff that keeps us up at night are people problems. And if we can understand the people better, we can solve the problems, and then we can we can work better. Right on. That's great, Allison. Thank you. So we're going to get into negotiation today, and, and you know I'm interested that, and I found it interesting the title of the workshop is really about sort of building stronger relationships. And I think for, for myself, and I'm probably not alone, when I think about negotiation, uh, my, swamp, my palms get, uh, get sweaty, I feel some anxiety, and it oftentimes feels confrontational and adversarial. So uh, why, don't, why don't you sort of explain to us the dynamics and the science around uh, really great negotiation? Totally. Um, and I'll actually talk specifically about um, anxiety and as something that's coming up a lot in terms of things we're dealing with right now. Um, I will say as I get I get started first, thanks to, to results for um, having me here. You guys are great uh, partners to work with and all the time um, that we've known each other because I love that you share sort of a, a love of behavioral science just like I do. And um, the interesting thing for me is that I've actually attended the past two sessions as a participant, which has been a fun unexpected benefit of having my schedule changed is that I'm always speaking. I never actually get to be an audience member. So I got to listen to these great sessions with John, John and Amber the past couple weeks. And when I'm done with this, I look forward, I get to be a results participant again. So I appreciate you giving me content for my own um, development as well. So yeah, for the time here, I'm going to be talking about science and strategies for negotiating um, during these unprecedented times. So you know, all kinds of things that could be going on. Last week, um, Amber Mack talked about, you know, if you're trying to maintain your, um, your business's financial viability, going to vendors and asking for a discount to reduce your expenses until business resumes. Um, or in John's session, I had a question came up, um, what, what do you do when a customer asks you to refund a non-refundable deposit? That's a negotiation. Um, job seekers who were really excited to get hired and then all of a sudden are thinking about trying to negotiate the offer in these challenging economic times um, or people who have to leave their jobs and now are thinking about, can I get compensated, can I get severance? And then I talk to people who are basically like, it's business as usual or business is better, right? I'm actually benefited by what's going on here and I have all these negotiations, but should I act like everything is business as usual when for other people around me it may not be? So there's a, a lot of negotiations happening here that are not directly related to COVID-19, but are kind of shaped by it. Um, 
So I put together some advice. None of my advice is COVID-19 specific, meaning it's all science-based. It was all true yesterday. It'll all be true in 2021, but just things to think about that might be kind of coming up right now and, and particularly relevant. So um, I, I think we should start, before we start with what's different, I'm gonna start with what's not different, right? Negotiations have been and always will be interactions between human beings. And what I always tell people is, in any negotiation that's ever happened since the beginning of time, if you can figure out what the other person wants and you can find a way to give it to them, you can solve the problem, right? That's no different um, now than it is, than it was you know, any other time. So that's something to keep in mind is that not, we don't have to throw out everything we know. The second thing is um, that all successful negotiations start with a good plan. So I always tell people you should be planning it, not winging it. Right? I'm just going to go in there and figure it out as I go along is the first sentence to every failed negotiation story. And that's all the more true now um, when we think about like, being a little bit uncomfortable in, in, in a new environment. So what I'm going to talk about is um, sort of three categories of advice that all relate to things that we should think about in our pre-negotiation um, planning. And uh, the first one is, I believe, well, choosing your mindset. And what I mean by this is getting yourself mentally prepared and also getting inside the head of your audience. One of the interesting things about to me about research and negotiation is so much of it is mindset driven, right? Forget the circumstances of the problem you're trying to solve. Where your head is has a great impact on what kind of deal you're able to achieve. And, and um, that's good because it means it's something that we can, we can control. Uh, so you mentioned anxiety, right? One of the things we know is that negotiations can make people anxious and anxiety is not good for negotiators. Any situation we're anxious in, we wanna get out of as soon as possible. So how do we do it? We are less aspirational, we ask for less, we concede more quickly, we, we try to exit. Anxiety is not our friend in negotiation. The interesting piece, and I think the piece that relates to, to what we're dealing with now in society, is that the research shows anxiety does not have to be about the negotiation to hurt the negotiation. So a uh, cool study where they played music for people before they negotiated. And some people heard classical music and other people heard the shower scene from Psycho. Like, ee, 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 ee. Right? Nothing to do with the negotiation. And then they had to negotiate. And the ones that listened to the Psycho music, they did worse. So I say that because there's a lot of stuff that's kind of making people anxious right now, much of it having nothing to do with negotiations. But if that anxiety exists, there's reason to think it can carry over into the conversations that we're having. And so if we're feeling anxious, if our people are feeling anxious, it's not great to send them out to be negotiating. We're much better off waiting until we're in just a better psychological state. Um, the other mindset thing I think it's important to keep in mind is um, staying aspirational, right? So aspirations are your goals in a negotiation. More ambitious aspirations drive better performance. Basic goal setting theory, right? More ambitious the goal, the better you do. Well, what's interesting is if we're in challenging times, right? Challenging economic times, it's easy for us to talk ourselves out of being aspirational. It's hard enough for us to do this on a good day. It's really hard on a bad day. Right? So we say things like, they won't be able to afford that. They don't have to agree to that. We don't want to be talking ourselves out of our high aspirations at that point. It at this point, it just leads um, to, to bad deals. However, right, we also know good aspirations are not just like dreams plucked out of the sky. They are data-based. And so what I would advise people is, it's more important now than ever to be getting some data on what's possible. If circumstances have changed and you're not sure that your data from last month or, or even last week is good data anymore, get some new data about what informs this particular problem. And I'd say there's all kinds of sources of data. We can always talk about them. But the first thing I always tell people is go to your network, right? Your network is a great source of information. I guarantee whatever problem it is you have, someone else that you know has just dealt with this pro problem in the recent past. And if you can find them, you can get some data and you can, you can get some advice. Uh, I won't tell it now, but maybe if it comes up later. Um, I, uh, I I know Jeff and I share a like of uh, uh, American football, and uh, there's a good there's a good story about uh, uh, some of the uses of data in the NFL in terms of um, trying to resolve disputes around that. So maybe we have time later we can talk about it. Um, so the other thing is to, um, in these kind of times is anticipating resistance, right? Resistance in yourself, resistance in others. Basic idea is comes from the psychology of loss aversion. 
Losses hurt more than gains feel good. We do not like losses. We work really hard to avoid them. Well, this ends up impacting some negotiations because some negotiations we are involved in are about achieving gains, right? I have a new job. I'm going to negotiate with my employer about my compensation or my employment package. That's kind of gain oriented. But other negotiations are more about avoiding losses. Like I have a customer who wants some remedy or wants some refund. Really what a, the status quo is just preserve what I have and anything I offer here is going to be um, perceived as going negative. Those are negotiations which we refer to as negotiating in the domain of losses. And what we know psychologically is because losses hurt, negotiators become much more stubborn, difficult, resistant to make concessions when they're negotiating in a domain of losses. So it means two things. If, if it's us, right, we are the ones who think that we are losing then what we need to kind of acknowledge is that over my dead body feeling that starts that starts to emerge and we need to find a way to get past it and one of the ways that we can do that if we're the ones feeling that way is to bring in somebody else to advise us right a third party someone who's more emotionally detached to say help me plan through this problem so that i am not unduly resistant to making any concessions or trying to solve the problem Sometimes it's the counterpart, right? We're gonna to talk to somebody and they're going to be in this domain of losses frame of mind. We need to recognize that and anticipate it so that we can have a strategy for it. Uh, and one of the most effective strategies, although the hardest to execute, is for you yourself to stay calm in the face of their um, sort of perhaps difficult, stubborn, maybe even rude behavior. It's one of the hardest things to do, but I will tell you, my my um my husband, I always joke, like 99.9% .9 of the fights that my husband and I have ever had in the 20 plus years that I've known have all been started by me. And my husband has responded the same way in the, all the years I've known. Whatever it is I'm mad about, whether I'm right or I'm wrong, he always is, is like, I'm really sorry that happened. Let's see if we can find a way to fix it. And I will tell you, it is impossible to continue to yell at a human being who only responds with, I'm really sorry that happened. Let's see if we can find a way to fix it. Um, so if we can anticipate that someone is going to be psychologically threatened because they're going to have to give something up, we can have a response that doesn't escalate that cycle of, of sort of animosity and hostility, but actually um, de-escalates it. And then the fourth mindset thing I'll say is, is to focus less on why you need them and focus more on why, why they need you, right? This is, you know, advice I would give people any day of the week. But particularly now, right, in uncertain economic times, you might start to feel a sense of desperation to strike a deal. And desperation kills aspirations, for sure, right? This feeling, I just got to take whatever I can get because I can't afford to walk away. It's the surest recipe to end up with a, with a bad outcome. But the thing about that narrative is it's only focused on you, right? What's my situation with no thought about what is the other person's situation? People don't say yes or no to you because of how powerful you are, or how powerful you feel. They say yes or no to you because of how powerful they are and how powerful they feel. So we need to be, you know, we need to be thinking about this. So I was talking to somebody who's a job candidate and kind of feeling a little bit um, uh, defeated and negotiating with a potentially new employer because there have been stories and I've seen them in my own um, university and network where people's offers have been rescinded because all of a sudden, um, that that company is not in the situation it was several months ago. And that makes the candidate justifiably very nervous about engaging in a conversation, right? So if I push too hard, I'm gonna lose the job and I won't be able to get another job because who's hiring in a global pandemic and now I'm really desperate and so I can't aspire to for too much. But there's no stopping and thinking about, well, how is the person from the company feeling about this, right? Maybe they feel really powerful that they don't need you. Or they also might be feeling like, you know what? I'm working from home. I've got three kids that I'm homeschooling. I'm at my wit's end. I have so many tasks. I'm falling behind in my work. And you know what I don't have time for right now? Another job search because I couldn't get the person who was on the one yard line, right? To actually come across the, the goal line and, and join us. So I feel really desperate to get this person to say yes. So one of the things you want to think about, right? Even if you're putting together um, new product offerings, right? For these times and saying, hey, I'm gonna offer some special incentives. If, if you get your customers intrigued about those offers and they realize, right, they're scarce because you're not necessarily gonna offer them forever, right? They're offered during some unique times. 
um, it's something no one else is providing, it, it sort of increases their belief that they, they really need you, even though you also really need them. So what I encourage you to do is to, is to not just think about, but even write down the reasons that the people who are talking to you need you just as much or more as you need them. And then to think about how you can subtly craft your message to highlight that idea to them that, that they do need you, right? When you talk to, to a recruiter and you say, oh my gosh, like you have these kids and everything, oh my God, it sounds like you're swamped right now. And you know, well, we're the same, right? Neither of us wanna put searching for a job or searching for a candidate back on our list. So I'm sure we can work out something that we're really gonna be happy with. Kind of focus people on the fact that you are a solution to, to a problem that they, that they have. Right, so those good. are four things I encourage people to keep in mind for thinking about getting themselves in the right frame of mind before they start the, the negotiation. Right. I think, Barbara, you had a question. I'm not sure if I got answered or not, but uh, why don't you go? Yeah, actually, there was so many, Allison, because there was so much packaged in there. Um, but actually, I'm just going to loop back to my first one, because otherwise I'll sit and talk to you all day, and I'm sure people would rather hear from you. Um, but the first one is that anxiety piece, because as you said, it is popping up. And so all the way through the first part, I'm like, okay, what's the how? So I had read once, and I just really fascinated on your answer. The anxiety comes from us anticipating, like we're living in the future, anticipating some sort of outcome versus being present. It, you're not in want to talk to us about that. How do we stay present? And it sounds like the other one is how do we stay curious? Um, so that we don't bring all these other crazy things in with us. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, one of the best um, pieces of advice, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I can't attribute it, I don't know where it came from, was, I'm sorry, is don't suffer twice, right? That it is future oriented, right? In anticipation of something that could happen. Um, and in terms of trying to reduce anxiety, because a lot of anxiety is about assumptions. So I'll talk about this more. We have a lot of stories we tell ourselves in our own head about negotiations, and we don't test those assumptions by actually asking questions. And so the things that we're anxious about might be correct, but we don't know. So, and it, and it ties directly to being curious. So piece of advice I would give is any assumption, any anxiety, um, turn it into a question to the people that you're, you're talking to. And I always say, right, everyone's favorite topic in life is themselves and they will tell you amazing things if they think that you actually care so if you approach the negotiation with this genuine idea which is my job is to understand what you care about not necessarily because i'm solely altruistic but because understanding what you care about is where we can trade right where our, where our deal space is and so i think with anxiety and curiosity i go back to asking a lot of questions and and we know the most effective negotiators they ask twice as many questions as the average negotiator yeah, that's good. Uh, Allison, I was, I, I love the sort of choose your mindset. Uh, when I, when I see that though, it implies that you're, you're having a little bit of time or runway to prepare for these conversations. And I know in a lot of the conversations I'm having with business owners right now, uh, we don't have a lot of time to prepare because everybody's trying to do more with less. And, and plus we're, we're, we're getting a barrage of phone calls from customers and vendors wanting to negotiate perhaps it's rates or delayed payments on invoices or stopping a project. There's all kinds of stuff that's coming at us. So if you're caught off guard by a phone call that you didn't have time to prepare and choose your mindset, do you have any tools that you could access in the moment to be mindful of to help with the mindset piece? Besides just hanging up your phone saying, oops, it was a technology glitch or Zoom failed again. Yeah, well, look, okay, so a couple things. I will answer your question, but I will step back one step and say this. We have real emergencies and we have emergencies of our own making. And that is because we didn't take the time to anticipate something that we could anticipate, right? The second you get one of those calls, you should know that you're gonna get the second and the third. So the only excuse you have is in the first call, not the second and the third, because then after you hang up, you should be thinking about it. Um, uh, and a lot of times there are things that we could easily anticipate if we had spent back to the planet, don't wing it. That said, if you choose to answer your phone and not let it go to voicemail, and you're, you're caught um, in, the, in the moment, um, I would actually go back to the same strategy, which is I wanna ask a lot of questions, right? To have that curiosity. Tell me what your problem is. It, you know, tell me what it is like you think I could do to help you. And then to explore, right, where they're coming from, what concerns them. Um, and then if you need to buy yourself some time, um, to, to say, let me collect all of this and think about, you know, what you're proposing, what we might be able to do, and let me get back to you. 
what's the best way and, and time to do that. But the questioning does two things, right? It gives you moments to think, but it also allows you to learn what the root cause of the problem is. And so when we panic, we, that's when those assumptions start to come in, right? Okay, I know what's happening. If I don't give you a refund right now, you're going to, um, you know, basically refuse to, to be my customer. You're going to um, slam me on social media. I know exactly what's happening. None of that's been set, right? It's just the narrative we've had in our head. And um, so to explore, right, what would be a good solution for you? What actually concerns you right here? Um, what, you know, what could I do that, that could make you happy? And that's, that's how I would think about it. Okay, thank you. And I know uh, we, we have some questions coming into the Q&A and I wanna just encourage everybody again and remind you, if you have questions for Allison, Put them in the uh, in the specific Q and A chat box, not the regular community chat. So the Q and A box. Uh, Barb, you had another question. Actually, I was going to take one from that that sure. box if I could, and it was yeah. a, actually quite an interesting one. And it's that whole idea about who gets to speak first in negotiation, and the idea of if you speak first, do you lose? But then, what if you're both just sitting there staring at each other? <laughs> like, what do you do then? Um. So. Uh, I wouldn't sit and stare. That becomes awkward after a while. There's no evidence that speaking first um, leads to losing. In fact, if anything, there is, the research is the opposite. It's, there are a lot of pieces of negotiation science that are consistent with what people thought was probably true about the world, so I just confirm them. The one that surprises people the most is, is not on speaking per se, but when it comes to actually making proposals, making offers and solutions. Um, that the person who puts the first offer on the table um, does better, and that's the science. And that tends to contradict what people think. Now, we also know some pretty new research that came out that said it's, it's to your economic advantage to offer first, but it makes people feel really anxious. And so they do it, and it actually leads to them doing better, but it leads to them feeling worse about it. And this is back to where data comes in, right? If you can't put an informed first proposal on the table, you are, don't have enough data and you're not prepared enough to be in that conversation in the first place. And if you do have enough information, you should use it to your strategic advantage. The psychology of it is anchoring. So if I put the offer, even though you're not going to agree to it, most likely, you're going to counter offer, you don't like what I've said, it anchors the subsequent conversation more in my end of the, of the um, bargaining zone. And so I would say don't be afraid to speak first. Um, I don't think the offer is necessarily the first thing that should be come out of your mouth. There's other rapport building things you need to do first, and I'll talk about that. But when you get to making offers, don't be afraid to put it out there. You should be informed and you should take advantage of that psychology. That's interesting. I always thought, you know, you meet and then <clears throat> see who goes first, and it's the big chess game. So that, that's actually fascinating. Thank you for that. Jeff, do we have time for another question now from the chat box or do we need to, or the Q&A box, or do we need Allison to carry on? Let's take another question. Okay. So how about, this is kind of an interesting one, Patrick. Um, where are some basic tools or tricks to help the other party lower their levels and anxiety? And I guess you're oh. monitoring it, but any thoughts there? Um, I do, yeah, I do have some thoughts. So um, one is, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'll get to these, but I'll talk about them now. Um, um, humor and similarity are two that I would go with. Basically the idea is um, we want people to like us, feel comfortable with us, trust us. Conversations are always easier when the person we're talking to, right, has positive feelings about us. Um, mm -hmm. It leads them to share information. It makes them less anxious. And so, um, Humor is, is particularly useful. So the science on humor is that if I initiate a negotiation and at some point in the early stages of building a rapport, I do, do something humorous or I offer some humor into the conversation. One study I looked at like had people share Dilbert cartoons, which as you know, are not like fall on the floor funny, but they're <laughs> funny. So someone shared one about negotiation before they negotiated. And they found that when people shared these cartoons, they did better. And the psychology of it is, I make you laugh. You like me. You trust me. You then share more information with me. That is all to my strategic advantage, not to take advantage of you per se, but to figure out a deal that's going to work for, for both of us. So humor is a, is a good one. Um, I will just say, though, uh, we need to make sure that the humor is considered universally funny. So there's other research on egocentrism and, and humor, right? If we think it's funny, we think everyone else will think it's hilarious, and, and that's not always the case. Um, 
I was I was thinking about this. My my best uh, one of my best friends from high school is an ER physician in North Carolina, and um, she's been you know stressed and in the trenches and in the front lines and, and dealing with all of these um, life or death things. And I you know as, as her friend for thirty years, I tried to cheer her up. So I'm like, oh, there's a million memes circling. So I sent her some memes about you know weight gain and weight loss, which are always going around right now. And she responds with yeah, I'm not gaining weight, I'm losing weight because I have to wear my N95 mask for 12 hours without taking it off and I can't eat. And I'm like, okay, that was a fail. I'm like, oh, here's some funny homeschooling memes, okay? <laughs> and I, so I sent her the homeschooling ones because we have a bunch of young kids. And she said, oh my gosh, I would um, uh, love to be homeschooling my kids right now. Like today I intubated a, a 40 year old um, COVID patient and I'm like, okay, second fail. So, um, Thankfully, she was my friend and not a person I was trying to negotiate with. But humor is really good as long as your humor is going to be definitely universally appreciated and seen as funny. Um, now, the second one I, uh, I'll say now is similarity. Okay, birds of a feather flock together is true. Opposites attract has no empirical support. We like people who are like us, and one of the things that we should be doing is always looking for opportunities to find and highlight genuine points of commonality, not fake points, because that gets, um, you know, it feels very, um, uh, uh, I don't know, car, like a car sales kind of negotiation. But instead, if they're genuine points of similarity, even if they're unrelated to the negotiation, when we, when we um, talk about them, it reduces anxiety, it increases rapport. And, and the beauty of what we're going through, right, for as tragic as it is, is it gives everybody something to talk about that they have in common. And so all of a sudden, one of the things you have been handed as a strategy is if you can't play similarity right now, you never will. Because we have all these points of commonality with people that we might have thought before are really different. So I would focus on those two as specific tactics in the early stages to kind of reduce anxiety, humor, and similarity. Okay. One, one last real, real quick one, Allison, only because I think you answered this, but just to make sure, it's, it was a question about how do you funnel emotions <clears throat> for me out of the negotiation? And I think you talked about adding that third party. Do you want to just do that one quick and then we'll let you carry on? Yeah, so, um, so a, um, a couple of things. Like, it depends on what kind of emotion you're dealing with. I'm assuming people mean negative. Um, yes, I think third parties help. So one of the things we know is when one party to a negotiation is represented by multiple people, everyone does better. So bringing a, a person onto your side or even if they bring someone onto their side, it helps. Um, mainly because it's not so much that it diffuses things emotionally, it actually helps information sharing. It's really hard to talk and listen at the same time. And so the more people we have, the more we can actually do a better job of information sharing. But I think other people help. I think remaining calm in the face of negativity helps. I think taking breaks and, and allowing people's physiology to actually come back down to baseline is also something that's very helpful. Okay, great. I'm very carry on with your presentation. Thank sure. you so much. Right. Okay, so, so the other thing I, I want to spend just a little bit of time just offering a couple thoughts to people is choosing a medium. And what I mean by is what the communication channel is going to be, particularly now that for most people, face-to-face -face is not an option. So now, if we're going to be negotiating, we're doing it in some electronically mediated way. Um, all mediums have use. Um, the best medium for your problem is the one that's going to facilitate the exchange of information from the parties. Generally, that is not email, okay? You should be avoiding negotiating over your email unless you're sure one of two things is true. The other person loves you or the other person hates you. And the idea is it is really hard for you to communicate intent over email. And we know that email senders they overestimate how accurately the tone of their email statements can be decoded. So if I take what I know is one of Jeff's favorite movies, Rocky IV, and I say, Rocky IV, right? That's a sequel. Kind of sounds excited. But if I say, Rocky IV, that's a sequel. Okay, same words, but with my face, you can see that now I'm not so, that, that's sarcasm, right? Um, on the page, those two statements are exactly the same. And rereading and reading our emails a million times before we send them, it does not help because when you reread your email, you read it in the tone of voice that you would use if you said it, which is not available to the person or to the recipients. So email communication results in a lot of um, miscommunication. Um, and, 
So in one of my friends, I don't know if it's an actual statistic, but I, I always repeat it. She says 80% of emails are written to clarify a previous email. So the idea of back to the person loves you or hates you, the idea is if you are working with people for whom you already have a strong bond and you're cooperating, you're already good at sharing information, email is just fine, email away. Because the idea is, yeah, you lose tone and you lose intent, but the other person already feels positively about you, they're gonna presume positive intent, fine. If someone hates you, if you have a very hostile negotiation, email actually does help facilitate information exchange because it does remove these other channels, my voice and my face, that are not helpful in hot, more hostile negotiations. Because if you have decided that I am your enemy, everything I say and do will be coded that way. And so the fewer channels we have to actually manage, um, the better. And so the science has shown that in very cooperative, um, um, contentious negotiations, email can be useful. The problem is that most of us, most of our problems fall in between the love and the hate, right? They're kind of in the middle. And those are the ones that you actually want to work to get off your email. Um, since face-to-face -face isn't an option, I will tell you that video conference is better than phone because you want as many mediums of communication. So being able to see me is better than just being able to hear me. Um, if you have Zoom overload, which you, you have every right to feel at this point, then what I would tell people is move some of the other meetings in your life to just phone or email and save your video conferencing for your higher stakes problem solving because it is important to be able to, to see them. Um, so this is the, my, my piece about taking time um, to build rapport. And, I, and that's always true. It's particularly true in a virtual environment, especially because the virtual environment can feel a little awkward when you're um, getting on it. Um, there's not one way to build rapport. But, I, but humor is, is a good research-based strategy, and I feel like everyone can use a little humor in their lives right now. So planning out you know, some way that you can um, engage, uh, begin with levity, I think, is always um, good. The other thing I would say is, in any negotiation, people care right? Um, that, that we are listening to them, that we hear them, that we are validating and, and, and giving um, acknowledgement to the things that they are saying. Um, that is a little bit harder to do uh, in Zoom, right? It's harder to communicate that you're listening with your eyes for a variety of reasons, right? Like I have two screens here. So when I look like this, am I ignoring you or am I actually really paying attention to this is where your face is or this is where the notes are? If I look down, right, am I looking at my phone or am I actually taking notes? And so what, a couple of things, note taking is a great way to signal that you value what somebody is saying if I write it down, I am giving the words importance. But you may not be able to see me taking notes here and wonder like, why do you keep looking away from me? So verbalize, um, I'm gonna take notes here. So if you see me looking down, that's what I'm doing. Or I'm gonna mute myself because I'm gonna take my notes on the computer while I talk to you and I don't want you to hear all of my, my typing. Um, when you're on a platform like Zoom, you have to use paraphrase and repeat more than you even would. It's always a good idea. Paraphrase and repeat is, so what I hear you saying is, and then you fill it in. It does two things. It conveys to the person you're listening, and if what they, they said is not what you heard, it gives you an opportunity to correct it before you've built a whole strategy based on a faulty assumption. So we should always be doing it, but we need to do a little more paraphrase and repeat. Um, and then the idea of you know, validating somebody else's perspective, okay? Um, we always want to hear that the way we see the world, we think the way we think about things is, is valid. And that's not the same as necessarily giving some, somebody everything they want. So if you have kids, right, you do this all, all the time, right? Which is, I want you to feel heard, my child, but that does not necessarily mean at the end of this that there is an open checkbook or, or open permission to do whatever it is you want. Um, and we have to think about that idea in, in our professional negotiations as well, right? If someone's business is struggling and they're they're coming to you, you should val validate that in some way, right? Mm -hmm. I hear where you're coming from. A good solution for you is one that is basically going to reduce your expenditures in the next quarter, right? Saying that doesn't commit you to doing anything, but it does go a long way to actually managing your reputation as a trustworthy counterpart in your uh, person in your counterpart's eyes. Um, in week one, John Spence actually mentioned this book, which I haven't read. It's called I Hear You, and he talked about it. And it basically, as far as he described it, as I understood it, it was all about validation, right? 
And, and how do we actually listen to somebody and validate their, their perspective? Um, and I think this is very important. We have a tendency when we negotiate, and particularly in North America, right, to feel like validating means I'm agreeing with you. And if I agree with you, that weakens me. Back to Jeff's idea about it's more competitive. And I wouldn't think about it that way, right? I would think about the ideas. When I validate you, I said, I've heard you. And if I said, I've heard you, you actually are more interested in being in a relationship with me and being more interested in trying to trying to find a way to, to solve the problem together. There's so a phrase, Allison, I was going to just jump in quick and just please. say there's a, uh, there's a trusted advisor seminar I attended uh, a, a year ago. And, and in that seminar, there's some research around one of the most powerful phrases that you can use to validate and express that you're listening to somebody is sounds like. So, and then whatever you want to say after, you know, and it works great in personal relationships too. If traffic was bad on the way home from work, wow, honey, it sounds like traffic was horrible. And it is amazing how people feel heard when you say that phrase. I, I use it often. So anyone that's on the uh, on the show today, uh, you know, don't hold that against me or call me out if I use that in our conversations. Um, yes, yeah, no, it's great. I love it. It's perfect. I'm gonna. I, I now I'm gonna pay attention to do I say it or can I use it? Can I use it more? Yeah, there's a couple of these. Um, you know the um back to the paraphrasing and repeating. You know, Brene Brown uh, does the one the story I'm telling myself in my own head, right? Like um that can be for a different one of trying to say you know what I what I think is happening, right? But correct me if I'm wrong and to turn that into a dialogue. I love it. Yeah, I was I was giggling in the um in the Q and A box here. There's a um, I'll get to the question part of it, but at the end of it, it's, thanks, Bill, for putting it in. But you know, a younger daughter says, "I hear you say no, but let's pretend you said yes." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, we're living that these days. Um, Bill's actual question, though, that went with that, Allison, was was just that: how do we work on the inner negotiation with employees? This is a time where we, especially right now, where we need people to say yes. And how do we start with yes, and then if we have to get to no? Any advice there? Um, probably. So it's in terms of internal, ask me that right. question again, because I want to make sure I understand. Yeah. So the idea was on internal negotiations with employees. Yeah. How can we help them start with yes in the negotiation would be my understanding or work from a position of yes before we get to no, instead of just this immediate no, no. Oh, um, so yeah. Um, uh, uh, so a couple things. Um, one, like I, I'm, I'm assuming this is about like taking on discretionary things or doing something in a different way, or maybe it's outside your job description, but now no one's job description really works anymore. So now I need people pitching in and I'm getting a lot of requests like this from my own university. Can we put this together? Can we do this? And there, I, I think what I'm hearing is there could be that. Um, sounds like uh, somebody could be saying, um, how do you get people to think about doing that first rather than um, uh, saying no? So, I mean, a couple things. If I think about um, uh, why do people say no to this, in a lot of cases, right, all we see is the request that we are making and not necessarily the demands or the requests from the other side. So if we think about this as a negotiation, I wouldn't just fire it off as a question via email, right? Can you do this? Um, again, back to the idea of what's that about? Are we building rapport? If it's important, what I would say is here is something that, would really benefit us. Let me talk about why it's really important. And then to say, for you, to, could you do it, right? And let's say we get, no, no, no. Uh, or phrase it a different way. It would be really important for us to do this. What are the circumstances under which you could make this happen? Because it is a negotiation. Can you take something else off my plate that's less important? Can you give me more resources? Can we reallocate something in some way? Um, I can't do it now if I tell you why, but I can do it next week. And so if we start to think about that as not just a yes, no question, which is here's what I really need. What do you really need to say yes to this? And then think, is there a solution there uh, or not? Got it. And Elsa, maybe this is a good time. This came up again. The, the book that you had mentioned, John said was, I hear, I hear you, right? Is that correct? That's what he said. I have no independent, uh, verification of that but yes that's what he, he mentioned I think I think that's why I recall as well and then early right out of the gate here um, just because we're talking about books I just want to answer that one but uh, we also had a question just coming in in regards to negotiation is there resources that you would recommend and then we can kind of put them in the, the Q&A for people yeah um, 
There are, there are several. Um, there's a couple um, good books that are written about negotiation. Um, uh, Maggie Neal has, has a couple. Um, Getting More of What You Want is the most recent. Max Bazerman has a couple, um, along with Deepak Malhotra, who has a couple. Um, uh, Negotiation Genius, they wrote. And then um, Deepak just wrote another one, which I actually haven't had a chance to read yet, called Negotiating the Impossible. Um, here's what I will tell you, doing a lot of negotiation research, teaching, and reading a lot of practitioner books, they generally all have the same science in them, and they just have different applications and stories, so there's not, you don't need to read them all, and, and one isn't necessarily um, better. Um, I like um, HBR, Howard Business Review, has a lot of great shorter articles and summaries that I, um, that I use a lot for thinking about digesting the science of negotiation, so those would probably be my two main recommendations. Okay, awesome. We better let you get to your choose your strategy because I'm excited to, to hear all the wisdom. Okay, all right. So, so choosing strategy. So I, I have strategy singular here. It does not mean you have to choose only one thing. This is just a list of things to keep in mind. And you know what I if you've heard me talk about negotiation before, you've heard me say the analogy that I think about negotiation like a like negotiation tactics like a Swiss Army knife. So if you have this knife and it has all these little tools and gadgets. And collectively, it helps you solve a whole lot of problems. But for any given problem, not every tool in the knife is useful. So what you want is a lot of different tools so that for a single problem, you could say, all right, what am I going to use here? So I talked about um, uh, similarity, right? This idea that similarity builds liking and, and trust. Um, and uh, I, I, I was kind of reminded once of this funny time where it wasn't a strategy, it was just pure luck on my part. I went to meet somebody I didn't know about doing some, some work with her and we went down to the cafe in the basement of her office building and bought to get some coffees and it was just coffee. So you have this um, awkward moment where you have somebody you don't know and you have the coffees and it's, you're not gonna split it because they're each you know 83 cents, but you're gonna um, just, one person's gonna pay. We both pulled out our wallets at the same time to offer to pay. And as we're standing next to each other, we look and we have these two absolutely identical, very recognizable wallets, right? And the woman looks at me and she says, nice wallet. And I say, nice wallet. And then later we're talking and at some point in the conversation, I mean, I've known this person for all of 30 minutes. Uh, she, she says a phrase and she says something like, they are, they're, they're not like us. And I said, oh, we became an us, right? All because we had the same wallet, right? Similarity is the strongest basis of liking and attraction that psychology has ever documented. And there was, that was not a strategy on my part. There was nothing I could have done about that that day, but we can use that same idea as a strategy. So whether it is the fact that we all have working from home, kids at home, whatever it is, as shared experiences, we should be highlighting those in every negotiation. Um, two to three solutions at a time. This is um, a great and underused strategy. The basic idea is this. Whenever you have a problem to solve in life, you do yourself a great favor by putting more than one solution on the table at a time. We tend to make offers sequentially. So I, I offer you something and, um, and if you say no, then I might propose a new solution. The idea of this strategy is you put two or three ideas on the table at the same time where you're indifferent between the solutions that you propose. So you could say, hey, you know what? I could refund half your deposit now or I could keep your deposit, but I could allow you to apply it in the future with no expiration date and a 25% discount on those future purposes purchases. Okay, I'm just making that up. The idea here is it's not just about what the solutions are. It's the fact that you've offered more than one at the same time. The act of offering more than one makes you appear more flexible, more cooperative, and more interested in solving the problem, all of which make people like and trust you more. So um, back to that question about internal negotiations, right, or if something is contentious, if I can just say, hey, we could do it this way, or we could do it that way, right? Back to parenting. I do that with my kids all the time. We could have this option. We could have that option. We do it for the exact same reason, which is I, I, I want to, to have you thinking about a narrow solution set, but I do want to manage my relationship with you, and I want to make sure that that relationship is strong. Um, the um, self-praise, okay? You know, you, at these times, we might feel like we're really going out of our way to help somebody else or to bend a policy to benefit them, which is great. Um, but we need to be careful of, of labeling our own behavior. Um, 
with uh, any uh, a superior in any way. So anytime you label your own behavior as being better than somebody else, you offend them. So I, this is a more, you know, I'm being more than fair here, or this is a really reasonable request back to making the request of our, of our you know, internal uh, employees. When we say fair, when we say reasonable, when we say generous to label something that we're doing, what the other person hears is, I am better than you. Okay, and that actually really aggravates people. So we find that the best negotiators, I'm sorry, the average negotiator praises themselves about 11 times in an hour, and the best negotiators um, do it only twice. Um, so assumptions kill deals, uh, ask questions. I mentioned that, that before, I won't say a ton more about it now, but again, we need to be asking a lot more questions. Um, and um, offer framing. So I wanted to offer something here new that, you know, sort of hot off the presses. And so interesting research just came out last, last month. And the idea is that there's this um, documentation of a specific strategy. And that is whenever you make an offer, to ask the person that's receiving the offer how that offer compares to that person's bottom line or sort of their walkaway point. So if you're trying to, you know, trying to sell a product, you offer a price of $100, you could say, how does that price compare to your budget for this? Or if you try to hire someone, you could say, how does this salary compare to your minimum compensation requirement? The person may not answer truthfully, they may not answer at all, but it's not actually the point of the question. The point of the question is to shift the other person's mind away from their aspiration, what do I want, and shift their mind to a different question, which is what can I live with? And this was a strategy that was, that was really effective. Um, and then, you know, I, I referenced in some of the, the um, uh, marketing for this about what to do um, if you have to put off a negotiation, right, that you thought you were going to be having right now and you, and you just can't do it, right, if you're sitting on the sidelines of your business or life in some way. Um, what I would say is that we should be using this time um, to be building our social capital, right? There are people in our professional lives we cannot say no to, um, that if they call us, whatever they ask, we are going to do. Um, and our goal is to be that person for as many other people in our lives as we can. That when we call them, we are the person they can't say no to. And, and the way that we do that is by adding value over time, right? Making introductions, forwarding information people think would be helpful. Other people told me they do it by liking other people's LinkedIn posts or writing a thank you note a week or giving a compliment a day, right? Um, if you are having to, to sit out of negotiations that you wish you were having, use your time to build your social capital, you will get to draw on that um, again and again. Um, and then the final thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll stop, is um, to close with a piece of advice I got once, and it was, had nothing to do with negotiation, but the piece of advice was someone said to me, Allison, when in doubt, love. Um, and I think that that's very applicable to what's happening here when people are asking me, like, should I make an exception to policy and help this person out? Should I believe their story? Or are they just you know, kind of using it as a negotiation tactic? And I would say this, if you are torn as to what to do, I would just encourage you to err on the side of, of love right now and think of it as a form of as a deposit for future withdrawal, right? Um, I, I, I don't want to have the reputation of being taken advantage of, but I would much rather have the reputation as, as a negotiator that's too kind than one that wasn't kind enough. So that'll I'll let that be my, my last yeah. one. Yeah, well, that's good. When we think of, uh, I think it's fascinating the 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 advice to offer options to people give them two or three options now we we know right now that for businesses are in all kinds of uh, various states some are uh, some are doing better than others if you really are in a state of desperation where you're not sure if your business is even going to survive this crisis how do you offer options with the for the sake of building long-term trust when you might not have a business around to even see the benefit of that goodwill um, well, I, I mean, what I would, what I would say is, um, the only way the options idea works is if they are options that you actually are okay with other people choosing. So we shouldn't be making proposals that we're not prepared to actually follow through on, or we're worried about that. Um, and so it's not just the idea of making multiple options. It's the idea of, I don't care which one you pick. Um, and that's very, that's very important. And um, look, I, well, the other thing is, I think, to think about things that can be traded, right? So one thing that we can trade is time. Um, if, if one person has greater costs of time than, than the other, I was saying, um, you know, I have a personal situation where um, a builder who built something for us, it just it is, de is defective. And we found out the very first day of being 
quarantined at home. And the, and the builder said, I owe you to fix this and it's on me, but I can't afford to fix it for you right now because I think that I will go under. And I said, well, I can't afford to not have it fixed. So how about this? I pay you what it takes to fix it and you credit me back all of that starting in 2021 for all the, because I've been engaged in a long-term relationship with getting some other stuff from them. Right. So in that sense, right, we're trying to think about creatively, what other variable can I put in? If it's just about money today, there's nothing else. But is it money today versus money tomorrow, right? Give me a better deal and then we can do something. So that's, for people who are really thinking about, like I'm just trying to get to tomorrow, I would think about proposing some of the creative solutions that say, um, what, how can you work with me that it's to your advantage to do this too, but what I'm getting is the immediate benefit and then I'm gonna give you something longer term. Right, okay, thank you, Allison. So as we wrap up, and I wanna thank Barbara and Allison for joining us. What a wonderful way to spend an hour. Uh, this goes by so fast. I mentioned earlier that if we didn't get to your questions, you can message us at info at unleashresults.com. The other thing I'm gonna put out there is take this framework and use it and let us know how it's going and send us your stories to that email at info at unleashresults.com. And uh, what, we're, what I'm gonna propose here is if we get some really interesting stories come in, we'll actually uh, give a $100 gift card for the best story of negotiation over the next couple of weeks here. And we'll, we'll get you to film a video and we'll put it on our social media platform. So send us your stories, let us know how you're doing. Uh, so this is episode three, episode four is coming up next week, but I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, we're also making today available, if you click continue, when you leave this webinar is to click on uh, uh, continue so you can not only give us some feedback, but you'll also see some special offers we're making available there. If you actually want to have a specific session for your own management team, we will do that for people uh, because we're so grateful that you joined us for this hour. It's absolutely free. Uh, please fill out the survey and then do us all a favor, follow Allison on LinkedIn. She just sort of revved up her LinkedIn engine in the last month. She is so funny and she's so informative, give her a follow. She's one of my favorite follows. Every morning she's got something on there from her family or her kids, and there's always a lesson that we can take. Uh, so next week, we are gonna be joined uh, by former Olympian, Dr. and Dr. Karen McNeil. We're gonna talk about the resilient leader. There are all kinds of things coming at us right now in terms of emotions and uh, demands on our time. Uh, we're trying to be there for our people and our families and our companies, and we're compromising and sacrificing time for ourselves. So how do we establish resiliency? How do we keep a strong mindset when everything around us, uh, for most of us at least, is very uncertain? So Karen is a wonderful speaker. She's full of insight. She's even going to tell us uh, some of the stories that she has from the time that she spent with the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks, uh, um, Pete Carroll, and what Pete Carroll does to build a strong, committed culture within the, uh, the million dollar athletes that make up the Seattle Seahawks uh, and Super Bowl contenders every year. So it should be a wonderful conversation. The recording of this one will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, please can keep, uh, keep in touch with us through our various channels and thank you everybody so much for your time. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure for us to be able to spend this hour with you and we're just trying to add some value and, and so I hope that we accomplish that uh, today. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Allison. Uh, you're such thank wonderful you, folks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. And thanks for everyone for joining us and allowing me to get on here again. So it's great to see you, Allison, and uh, love, love the thoughts. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Fantastic as always. <laughs>